78% of people listen to a podcast to learn something. If I put the interview in a three act structure, I don't have to do as much editing and moving around things because we know the flow. At first glance, producing a virtual podcast from start to finish might seem easy. You grab a friend or two, everyone gets on the Zoom link, you press record, and then you publish to YouTube and Spotify for everyone to hear you talk about your best high school memories. Maybe not that last part. Producing a well done virtual podcast from start to finish takes a lot of good workflows for you and potentially a team. You have to manage guests, keep an eye out on the ever changing tech landscape, and then get your podcast out into the world. In this video, I brought in Joe Casabona, who is a podcast systems coach to walk through systems and workflows to make producing a virtual podcast from start to finish as easy as possible. So let's start before you even hit record on a podcast. Joe, how do you go about finding guests for your podcast? Generally finding guests, I do it uh, a few ways. I look in my network, right? And so if there, there are people I know personally or people who are like tangentially related to, to me in some way, I'll usually reach out to them via DM, right? I'll find them on the network that we're connected to uh, and I'll reach out to them. If it's like a totally cold pitch, if it's someone that I want to have on the show, but I, I have no connection to them personally, I do have like a kind of scripty email. But the most important part of that is it's not just like come on my podcast. It's like, here's my audience. And I love what you talk about in re with respect to whatever topic. The pitch is personal, right? It's not just like a mass email. And then the third way is I use a, a service called Podmatch. You can sign up to be a host looking for guests or a guest looking to go on more podcasts. I run a very similar process for guests on this channel. Typically, I'll batch my interview guest outreach. I'll reach out to 10 to 20 people at a time. About two thirds of them will be people in my network. And then the other third will be people that look super interesting that I don't know. Here's the template that I've used to ask people. As you can see in my template, I already have an idea of what concepts I want to cover and what structure the interview might have. Joe has a bit of a different approach to structuring a podcast episode. Most interviews start off this way. Hey, everybody, I'm with Joe Casabona. He's a podcast systems coach with over 20 years experience in web development, teaching and podcasting. Joe, how are you today? Blah, I'm great, blah, blah, blah. So tell us who you are and what you do. You just told me everybody who I am and what I do. That is very boring. You probably tell everybody who I am and what I do in like the pre-recorded cold open too. So the three act structure puts the interview through the lens of a story. 78% of people listen to a podcast to learn something. If I put the interview in a three act structure, I don't have to do as much editing and moving around things because we know the flow. But then you're also drawing the person in sooner. You are the listener in sooner. Act one is the setup. How did you find yourself in the situation you were in? Act two is some sort of conflict. How did you get out of that situation? Or in my case, it's usually like, why can't I just do it the opposite way you're saying to do it? Because that's like a that's a conflict between me and the guest. Act three is the hopefully satisfying conclusion where we resolve the conflict. And in my case, we tell the listener the things that they can do to prevent the conflict from happening to them. Given Joe's advice, here's how I would see this three act structure playing out. Now, this isn't Joe approved. So Joe, if I got this wrong, I'm sorry. Starting with act one, how did the guests find themselves in the situation they were in? Let's say this guest has been posting on LinkedIn and has gotten all of their clients from LinkedIn. However, their reach on LinkedIn was cut in half because the algorithm changed and their content wasn't performing as well there as it was any longer. Act two, according to Joe, is some sort of conflict and how did you get out of that situation? Or as Joe mentioned, it might be Joe playing devil's advocate and saying, why not the opposite way? For this guest, they might say, I started creating content on YouTube and that got me an even larger reach to potential clients. As the host, you could dig into the reasons why YouTube was the answer and play devil's advocate for why there might be a better opportunity for greater reach. Why not blogging and SEO? Why not Twitter or X? You can already see how this, there's this tug and pull naturally in this three act structure between problem and solutions. It reminds me a lot of the Nancy Duarte TED talk. 
I'll link to that YouTube video in the description if you're interested. Act three, according to Joe, is resolving the conflict and hopefully coming to a satisfying conclusion. For this example, that might be figuring out that the guest target audience is a better fit for YouTube. And for other people, here's why SEO or Twitter might be the better fit. Even if you don't follow this specific three act structure, you need to have structure of some sort. You can't just riff off with whatever is on your mind that day or what happened to you. Here's Joe to explain why. People are like, well, like that's what Joe Rogan does. And I'm like, yeah, but people already care about Joe Rogan or people already care about Conan O'Brien. No offense. No one cares about me. No one cares about you. No one cares about most people. And so you got to answer the question, what's in it for them? Hearing Joe Rogan go on about whatever nonsense he's going on about that day is interesting to a lot of people, right? Hearing you go on about that nonsense is way less interesting. You got to answer the question, what's in it for me? I think for me and you and, and people who are doing a more educational podcast, the faster you can get to the win, the better. This is a good time to bring up again that the vast majority of podcasts, as Joe mentioned, are for educational purposes, not entertainment. Think about it this way. You clicked on this video to learn more about producing a virtual podcast from start to finish. If Joe and I spent the first two minutes talking about how much I hate his New York Yankees, you're most likely clicking off this video. This is a YouTube video, but the same point applies to a podcast. Stick to the problem you're solving with that podcast episode. So that's working with guests in structure. What about recording all this? Can you just use Zoom to record these virtual podcast episodes? So not Zoom. We're all inclined to use Zoom because everybody knows Zoom. It's easy. I don't have to explain it to anybody, but the way I describe it is Zoom is opinionated in the way that they process the audio and they have to do it so that they manage the connection. And so it's not going to come across as good. If there are issues with the internet, you're going to get like that weird robot voice or like stuttering or whatever, just like long pauses. You want to use a tool like Squadcast or, or I use Riverside. Both of those will record your audio onto your computer and video and the guest's audio and video onto their computer. And then at the end of the interview, it'll upload it. So you have the most pristine, intact, unopinionated audio for you to then combine and edit and get the quality like you're both in the same room together. To show you what this looks like, here I am in the back end of Squadcast, which is what I use to record this interview with Joe. You can see it's a bit different than what you'd get with Zoom. I can download the audio and video and they're separate tracks. Now, Zoom can do this too if you go into the recording settings. However, Zoom still isn't great for recording a podcast because it's very dependent on your internet connection and Zoom isn't optimizing for recording. It's optimizing for that live feed. With a tool like Squadcast or Riverside, they are recording locally to the devices you and your guest are using and then uploading those files to the internet. So even if your internet lags a bit during the interview, the audio and video are going to come out really clean. Squadcast and Riverside are optimizing for recording, whereas Zoom isn't. Now, let's say you've recorded an awesome episode and the quality is wonderful. What should you focus on in the edit, especially for someone who may not be trained up to be a podcast editor. What you really want to focus on in the editing process is tightening up the story. I've been in situations where I asked a question, I didn't prep the, the guest on that question very well, and it wasn't good. And so I cut that part out. I'm like, this is not adding to the story. It's not adding to the lessons that I want my listeners to take away. And then filler words, maybe, maybe Matt, you're going to edit that part out because there was a lot of like noises I just made there. I would say that should be secondary. You shouldn't spin your wheels doing that. I agree with Joe 100% on this. How you're crafting the story in your podcast is way more important than the filler words. In Descript, you can edit the story and the filler words pretty easily. Here I am in Descript, which natively integrates with Squadcast, the tool I use to record this interview with Joe. You'll see here the unedited interview with Joe, and you can see that there's text on the left. That's the transcript that Descript automatically generated from the video with Joe, so I can quickly glance and read how this podcast flowed. For me, when I'm interviewing, I'm in a zone of listening and finding the fascinating parts of answers from guests. I'm not really thinking about the flow of the story as I'm interviewing. With Descript, I can read through how the conversation went 
and then start making cuts and marking what's flowing and what's not. For filler words, the script can automatically remove all the filler words and you can remove more and more filler words as you move up in paid plans. For me, I tend not to have the script automatically remove all of them all at once. It feels too robotic and too edited when I do that. With Descript highlighting them as I'm editing the episode though, it does help me see where the filler words are and then take them out more easily compared to if they were not highlighted at all. There's a lot more great features in Descript, but I'd have to go through all of those in a different video. If you wanna learn more about Joe, check out the links in the description and definitely follow Joe for learning more about podcast systems. If you found this video helpful, give this video a like and sign up for the station newsletter in the description.